so welcome. I'm Natalie Pearson and I am based at the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre here at the University of Sydney. Um, if you're having any issues with the audio, just pop a message in the chat and we can deal with that, but um, hopefully you're able to hear me loud and clear. Um, so welcome to this workshop today. It's more um, a panel discussion, actually, uh, looking at academic pathways and why the first five years post-PhD are so critical. Um, so we have a wonderful panel of speakers who I will um, shortly allow to introduce themselves just to make sure um, we cover off on everyone. Um, but before we do that, I would like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land on which I'm zooming in from. The University of Sydney campuses are on the Gadigal lands um, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present for their ongoing care and custodianship of, of country. So let's get started with our wonderful panel. Um, as I said, I'm Natalie Pearson. I myself am an early career researcher here at the University of Sydney. I work uh, on critical heritage studies. I'm going to be running the session today, but if I have um, an answer to contribute, I might jump in. Um, but our main speakers are going to be, uh, first of all, Yvonne Lowe. Um, Yvonne, could you give us a wave so people can see you? Yeah. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hi, Yvonne. Um, would you like to just say a couple of words about yourself and what you work on? Yes, happy to. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Michelle, for inviting me. Um, so I'm also an early career researcher. Um, I'm a lecturer here um, at the University of Sydney um, teaching Asian art or broadly um, curatorial art as well, uh, studies. And um, I research on aspects of Southeast Asian art. I have um, a strong interest in Asian diaspora and transnationalism and women's history as well as digital methods. I'm working on multiple projects. Currently, I'm on the advisory committee of um, a, a, a project with AWARE and Asia Archive, as well as a contributor and editorial committee and curatorial committee of the Manifesto Way um, exhibition and digital publication. And I'm also a co-developer of a digital tool called Artists uh, Trajectories Map. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to have your art history perspective in the room. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, our next speaker is Sabine Zahirovich from Geosciences. Sabine, would you mind introducing yourself to us? Thank you. Of course. Thanks so much, Natalie, Michelle, and, and the whole SIAC family. Um, it's great to be here. I'm a geologist. A lot of my work is in Southeast Asia tectonics, geodynamics, um, landscape evolution modeling, and climate climate change. So, uh, but that's also embedded in a global uh, sense. We develop a software called GPlates, which is open source. And it's kind of decolonizing geology in a way. Um, and and just to plug GPlates, we've been uh, shortlisted for a Eureka Prize next week. We'll find out. So hopefully we can celebrate. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, great. So anyway, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Sabine. Good luck. And uh, finally, Aaron Opdyke. Welcome. Thanks, Natalie. Um, so my name is Aaron. So I'm currently based in the School of Civil Engineering and my research, um, it broadly looks at disasters and climate change adaptation. Uh, and a lot of that work at the moment, at least is focused in the Philippines, um, in addition to a number of other contexts. Excellent. Thank you. Um, now, the final speaker we have who's going to um, contribute along the way is the director of the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre, Professor Michelle Ford. Um, I might let Michelle just do a little wave. Um, but Michelle uh, is an experienced mentor of early career researchers and um, uh, mid-career researchers as well and has lots of wonderful strategic advice. So she's going to jump in uh, where appropriate. Um, but most of the time we're going to be talking with our panel. Um, I think we're going to run through some questions that we've prepared in advance and we'll spend the first half an hour or so doing that. And then there will be opportunity for our audience participants to ask questions as well. So if you have questions, um, feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll try to get to those after the first half an hour. Um, I'm going to ask our, uh, yeah, Min, thank you so much for taking the PowerPoint off. That's great. So we can see our speakers more clearly. Now, this um, workshop, uh, it's wonderful to see we have 90 participants. Thank you all for coming. Um, I hope it's going to be a great discussion. And, uh, you know, we've designed it for early career researchers. So what is an early career researcher? That is my first question. Um, I, and you're the one who posed this question to me, so I'm going to throw it back to you. And if you could uh, let us know what you define as an early career researcher. So my understanding of early career researcher is 
five years or eight years in some cases um, after you've gotten or you after you've been awarded your PhD. Yeah. So so five years is the commonly accepted term. But um, in preparing for this workshop, the uh, it, it turned out that there are a couple of different definitions. So in some faculties at some universities, the definition is actually eight years post PhD. Um, and then there are some grant schemes where the guidelines um, give you extra time. So if you have um, not spent five years doing research, but if you spent some of those uh, five years post PhD um, caring for your um, family or uh, looking after children or taking a break and doing something different in the workforce, basically your research clock is paused during those time periods. So the five years really is only five years of actual research time. And apparently there are some grant guidelines that specify you can have um, extra time if you've had children. I think um, of one, you were saying that the latest guidelines that you looked at allowed an extra two years for every child. Yes. So if you have four children, uh, two children, <laughs> then you get four extra years. So, so this is um, this is news to me, and I'm someone who's I, I would say I'm reasonably familiar with the latest grant guidelines, but this is news to me. So, I commonly understand that um, the common understanding of what constitutes an ECR is five years of research um, once you've had your PhD conferred. But uh, it's really important to note that the guidelines and definitions um, might change uh, from year to year across the relevant grant schemes or within your faculty, within your university, and that the guidelines for what constitutes an early career researcher will differ according to what the grant scheme is. Um, Aaron, did you want to jump in there? No, I was just going to add, I think a great example of that is if anyone has looked at the new ARC um, industry fellowships, um, the ECR scheme for that, for example, even the criteria is different than if you look at the DECRA scheme. Um, so I think it's just echoing what Natalie's saying. I think it's important that you look at the grant scheme. Um, and so an another program that I have some external funding through um, the Asia Pacific Network for Global Change Research, um, they define it differently. Uh, and so some schemes they might allow, for example, for you to count that, uh, you know, personal time, other schemes not. Um, so I think it's just important that you kind of look at kind of where you're applying uh, if there's a, a funding component to that. Absolutely. Now, Aaron, you've just mentioned the word DECRA, which I've been trying to avoid um, until now, but now's a great opportunity to um, talk about the DECRA and, you know, what that is. What is that acronym and what is its significance within the context of um, this discussion about the first five years post-PhD? I'm going to throw back to you, Aaron. Yeah, so it stands for the Discovery Early Career Researcher Awards. Um, and so that's the primary grant scheme uh, through the Australian Research Council um, here in Australia. And that's really sort of the, the entry point, I would say, for those in their early stages of their career breaking into external funding. Um, but it's also a prestigious award. So it allows you, it gives you funding to um, you know, pursue kind of your own research that, that um, allows you to step away from some of those administrative responsibilities or teaching responsibilities, um, lessen that workload to really focus on your research for a period of three years um, at the start of your career. And, and one of the reasons these DECRA, Discovery Early Career Researcher Award grants, are so prestigious is because, uh, you know, if you're successful, and the rates are very low, only 8%, I think, um, if you are successful in getting a DECRA, it pays for not only your project costs, but importantly, it pays for your salary. So um, universities love them because they get to have you off their payroll books for three years, but they still get the benefit of your lovely research and research outputs. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Sabine, because you are a DECRA um, winner. Um, you, you do have a DECRA. Um, but Michelle, if I can jump to you, we often talk about the DECRA clock when we're doing our research mentoring programs at SEAC. Could you just link that back to these um, first five years post PhD for us? What is the DECRA clock and why is it important that we're aware of that timeline? Okay, so the DECRA clock is a good example of what people have been talking about in, with regard to different timescales. Um, effectively, uh, five you have five years within which you can apply for a DECRA twice and you must do that before you reach that five-year limit. But the five-year limit 
is subject to a number of conditions. So, for example, if you've taken off time to have a child or you've been employed outside of academia, that doesn't count for the DECRA clock. Um, for those of you who are still students who are interested in a in an academic career, um, some advice I, I have often given to my students is don't be in a rush to graduate um, because the DECRA clock starts when you graduate, not when you hand in your thesis. Um, so depending on what else is going on in your life, it can be quite strategic to wait for that extra few months before you formally graduate to um, extend your DECRA clock. Yes, I was the recipient of such strategic advice and um, managed to submit my minor corrections at the last possible minute, um, which bought me a couple of extra months on the DECRA clock. And um, this is important because, as Michelle said, you only get two chances to apply for a DECRA. And... Um, you need to think about when you when you go for it quite carefully because if you go too early and we'll come to this in a moment if you if you go too early uh, you haven't sufficiently developed your track record in order to be competitive and in order to position yourself um and then you could you know waste one of your your decra chances um nor do you want to leave it too late because if you apply in the in the fifth year then you know that's that's one shot that you've had and one shot that you've missed because you don't get to apply in the sixth year. Um, so you need to make sure that you're having those discussions with your mentors and with your, you know, research advisors, your research officers, um, and make sure that you're positioning yourself so that you go for your DECRA, you apply for your DECRA at just the right time. Now, um, I'm going to come to Sabine. Could you tell us, uh, as someone who has um, been awarded a DECRA, what was the process like in terms of knowing when to go for it? Did, was there a moment where you thought, I'm going too early or I've left it too late? Have I got enough credentials? What was that yeah. experience like? So, so all I can say is that this workshop is uh, something I wish I had, um, you know, access to when I was going through all of this. Now, first of all, a very basic question is like, when does the DECRA clock start? Now, it's very clear. It's the conferral date. When you get that testimony and it's the date on the testimony right it's not when you are uh, you get a letter to say you've been awarded the phd it's what's on that piece of paper right so you need to write down that date B because you know it, it's not clear and it's not always yeah very easy to find now then uh, we've talked about these uh, uh ways to, you can pause the decker clock there are other ways you know there are other ways uh, an international relocation for example adds uh, I think up to six months or something like that so each international relocation counts and, and so on um, but also be very aware of the uh, uh, closing dates okay of the applications and one of the things that tripped me up was that uh, the government decided to change the date of submission from like I don't know it was like March to October and I had to rush I actually submitted my DECRA proposal and then I had to write a second DECRA to submit in a few months time because they hadn't released the results of, of the, that initial submission right so and then that date change can actually affect your eligibility as well so I agree with Natalie that um, you need to uh, it, I wouldn't go too early but also be very careful about going too late and one of the key things is that uh, you know, you, you almost need like a a year of a dry run of pulling things together, all the all the information, because it's the first time you're actually engaging with an ARC grant system, right? W one of the things for me is like, you know, uh, I was getting questions from the research officer at the school here, saying, "Can you please draft your first page and of part A of the DECRA, right now?" for a meeting with the research office. And I, I did that first page of part A and I got there and they were like, no, no, no. We meant the first page of the proposal. And I'm like, that's the, that's the first page, you know? And they're like, no, that's, we want, we actually wanted the first page of the proposal, which then was like part D of, of the whole thing. So um, th 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 these sorts of things are really crucial. Understanding the timelines, the university has a totally different timeline as well, right? You look at the, the closing date of the submission, you know, and the university usually has a month that you have to submit before or even earlier. So 
and there are other deadlines like you have to submit um some letters to the faculty and the school and and, and so on so there's a very not confusing but there are very specific milestones that you have to really map out mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully you can get some help and hopefully you know we in SIAC can can also help with that too yes and michelle thank you and so maybe much. it's not particularly useful to go much more into the actual details of the scheme but i think the broad point that sabine's making that really is important is find out early don't just trust that someone will tell you be proactive and um, every year it's a bit different and it's on you on, on potential applicants um, to work out that out if they want to go the decra path but i'd like to emphasize also that although decras are amazing and they really not only give you time to do research but credential you as a rising star, um, there are lots of other ways to succeed in academia as well in the first five years. Um, but if you do want to decorate, you need to get your skates on, work hard, and hopefully that pays off and sets you up for the future. Thank you, Michelle. That's a really good point. Um, I, I hope we can come back to that, but I just wanted to pick up on, um, you know, something uh when you submit your PhD, have it conferred, go to the lovely graduation ceremony, um, get your photo, Sometimes you're cut loose at that point. You might not have a nice little tutoring job or a, a lecturing job or, you know, a research assistant job to go into. So you're out there as a so-called independent researcher, hungry for an academic job. It's really important if you are pursuing an academic career in the Australian system at least, which is the one we're talking about here today, that you make sure you have research affiliate status shored up um, because having... Research affiliate status with, for example, the department that you did your PhD in will ensure that you can still not only access the library, for example, but tap into the research um, office and all the support that the research office brings with it. Um, you can't submit a DECRA without, um, or an ARC without in institutional backing, not as a lead chief investigator. Um, and actually, I think there was a question about research affiliate, which we'll come back to maybe we can ask it now, um, if you're affiliated with the university within the five-year window but none of your workload is research, is the DECRA clock paused? Um, Michelle might be best placed to answer that one. Um, I think if you're affiliated, for example, with University of Sydney but working in research elsewhere, I think your research clock would still be running, wouldn't it, Michelle? Um, basically, if you've got an academic position, your research clock is running. Um, if you're not earning money from your affiliation, you, I think – You'd have to triple check this, but it's my understanding you could make the argument that you weren't employed for research. And, and indeed, lots of people in professional work do have an academic affiliation. But if you're in an academic position, even if it's basically 100% teaching, that still counts on the DECRA clock. There are other ways of demonstrating track record too, um, outside of the teaching track, um, which are also important to establishing, um, you know, a good reputation and being someone that people think of when they're thinking of academic positions. So I just wanted to turn now to the issue of um, developing this track record um, and to think about, um, you know, what an ideal first five years looks like post-PhD in terms of... Um, in terms of teaching, in terms of research, and in terms of engagement, um, service leadership engagement, um, this this sort of admin catch-all category. Um, so, I mean, Aaron, could you tell us, for example, in, in your field, what is, is there an ideal number of, um, for example, publications you should have after five years? And are there limitations? I mean, are you supposed to publish sole authored? Do you only publish in top journals? Are you meant to publish a book? What's it look like for you and how does it differ across the disciplines? Yeah, so I think the first thing to start with is recognizing that each field is different. Um, so in my field, for example, journal articles would be something that would be preferenced, um, but that's quite different, I would say, in the social sciences. So where you know book manuscripts, for example, might be um, much more prevalent or, or preferred. So I think in um, some of the key things across that, though, to think about is really over the first five years is really showing leadership across all of those areas. So it's starting to show that you can take intellectual direction um, in that engagement, in the research that you're doing, that you can manage the teaching workload that you're presented with. Um, and so I think that that's a juggling act. So it, it's trying to um, you know be across all of those. But then it's also starting to, to narrow and kind of define what your identity is. So I think rather than thinking about sort of a specific number of publications that you need to achieve, um, I think you'll get some mentoring advice within your field about kind of what those norms or expectations would be. 
And I think it's, it's good to seek that advice, but I think it's also keeping a focus on the quality of the research that you're doing and keeping that front and center. Um, so, you know, three years, five years out, um, even within my area, for example, people might follow different trajectories where they might be doing or publishing earlier. Um, they might be publishing a little bit later, but I think it's really thinking about that five year or whatever that time period is that you're looking at and, and thinking about sort of as that early career stage is really trying to define what that trajectory is going to look like. Um, so where do you see yourself um, sort of building in terms of that leadership direction over those first couple of years? Thank you. Um, so Ben, would you be able to talk a little bit about how you positioned yourself uh, in the first five years in terms of leadership and engagement? You've got a pretty good track record in that domain. Yeah, look, yeah, one of the worst things that people I've seen do is they like, okay, I want to submit a deck row in a few months and suddenly they kick into gear and want to develop a track record, you know, to try to get awards or this, that, and the other. And it just doesn't work, right? You need to actually demonstrate sustained, I guess, upward trajectory. And from, from the research office, the strategic advice I received was that you, know, you, you need to, they want to reward emerging leaders. So you need to be an almost like a demonstrated emerging leader or in a leader of some sort in 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 some of the science. No, so as Aaron mentioned in in geosciences, I mean there's a preferred um there's a preference to peer-reviewed publications, journal articles. And so I was publishing um it, it, even during the PhD, I was doing a lot of outreach uh during the PhD and after the PhD. Uh, conversation articles, some media engagement, um, and you know, lots of volunteering in in things like the Geological Society of Australia, uh, and then um, I became involved with this International Deep Carbon uh, Observatory, and and so it was just a collection of all of those things. And as Aaron started to allude to, um, it's it's uh, probably also good to demonstrate that you have some collaborations, right, and uh, national and also international collaborations are, are good. And so co-authorships can be quite useful. So really the ARC, what it seems like, they're looking for emerging or existing leaders in something. And uh, you need to uh, convey to them in your proposal, why you and why now? Because in the DECRA particularly, you, you need there's a much higher emphasis on you as the person, right? There are, with each, each of the schemes, there are different weightings. Uh, on on different components. So yeah, that's I think the main points I wanted to make. Okay, that's that's good. Um, I mean, one of the things I felt when I finished my PhD was that I'd done all the work, right? And I was tired, and I finally got there, and I'd been striving for it for a long time, and finally submitted, had it conferred, and then it was time to take my my foot off the pedal, or was it? Um, Michelle, I'm going to ask you to comment on this about you know, working so hard during your PhD and can you afford to take a bit of time off and how much time off should you be taking if you're committed to pursuing an academic career? Uh, not much. Um, so it is important to um, take a moment. You don't want to burn out. That's really important. Hopefully, if you've managed your PhD well, you're not too exhausted at the end of it. Um, but a lot of people are, and it's if you start trying straight away, it is going to be very difficult. Um, but at the same time, some people feel like they deserve a gold star for their PhD, and they think they can they can rest for a couple of years while they're doing a bit of tutoring. They feel like they're not being paid for their research, which is true, right? If you're in a in a casual or sessional position, but if you want to be an academic longer term, even if you're not actually being paid for your research, you need to keep it tracking over because that counts towards your decra clock. And the hard message is really that your first five years is when you prove yourself, right? It's very hard to make an excellent academic career if you lose that opportunity in the first five years because people form opinions of you when they're thinking about promising young things to involve in various things. They think about the people who have stood out to them. Um, so the, the hard message is you need to get back on that horse and you need to be strategic. And there's there's a bunch of ways in which strategy can look. It can be different for different people. But some key things are not publishing for publishing's sake, publishing in places that are going to be recognised by the people who want to hire you or give you a grant. This means that there might be very 
useful, helpful journals that you would like to publish in politically or for other reasons, but you have to say, well, hang on, I want to do that, but maybe I'll wait for another couple of years until I've got my CV where it needs to be either to get that job or get that grant. Um, some other things I would say are, um, yeah, really thinking, having a plan. I mean, <laughs> I wasn't, I'm telling you what to, I think you should do, not what I did myself, but it's a different era, right? And it's, some people do fall into academic jobs, but most people who get academic jobs um, who are ECRs now are really strategic and are very focused and have a plan. And that means like, um, and then we might get Natalie to talk a bit about how she turned her thesis into a book in a very quick time for those of you who are in book um, related fields, but also working out how to position yourself because it's not just your general track record if you are going the decorative path it's your track record relative to the project right so if you and decorative projects are mostly not just oh i did this for my phd so i'm going to develop it some more that doesn't usually get people a decor so thinking about actually what you want to do in that big project and then positioning yourself to do it in it or if you're following more yvonne's path thinking okay a lot of people aren't super mobile. Am I mobile? Am I not mobile? If you're not super mobile for family reasons or other reasons, what makes me attractive to the two or three universities where I can actually work? And not just leaving that and not feeling that the university owes you a job. Lots of us do PhDs. Not many people get um, ongoing academic positions. So the competition is fierce and that is just a fact of life. And if that's not something that you're keen to engage with, then the best advice I can give you is work out what kind of work you actually want to do and go do that work because it can be very dispiriting thinking you're going to be an academic, not quite, not having a game plan in place and then not, you know, becoming someone who's on the edge of academia for a long time and maybe resents that. And I mean, I'm speaking very bluntly here, but I think it's important to say these things. And I can see there, yes, alternative careers are important. And there are lots of great jobs you can get with a PhD. So really think about, are you just thinking about academia because it's the obvious choice in some ways, or is it something you actually want to do? Yeah. And, and yes, there are alternative careers, but we did label this academic pathway. So I'm not going to talk about the alternative no. careers today because that's a whole other um, discussion. Mm. Um, uh, just talking about, you know, the competitive job market here, um, you know, I mentioned that the DECRA success rate is 8% or something like that. It's, it's I don't know. I think it's like 16. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's positive. Um, so, you know, and the Sydney Horizon Fellowships have just just closed and I understand that they, they're you know they were very popular received many applications you know if you haven't finished your PhD um, but you're desperate to have an academic job and you're sure that's what you want where should you be channeling your energy is it about applying for as many jobs is it a numbers game even if you haven't finished your PhD or should you just focus on finishing your PhD and not even looking at the job market until it's submitted um, that's a tricky question. Um, Sabine, would you like to I'll throw it to you and then maybe to Avon? Yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, I've now had a few projects now where I've um, hired postdocs. And the understanding that we always have is that it's we're happy to hire someone who's like at the very end of their PhD, that they're going to submit, you know, imminently in the coming weeks, right. you know, uh, from, from that date. So, you, you know, if uh, I... I yeah, I, do, I wouldn't apply for postdocs too early unless, you know, um, it specifically uh, as, says so. So um, that's that's really my main uh, advice. Okay. But yeah, it's good that you defined imminently in the next few weeks. Um, Avon, did you have thoughts on that on that question? Yeah, I also just wanted to add on to what uh, Michelle said about being strategic and so the whole idea of cruising off the PhD cruise strategically as well so there are many things that you can do while you take a break from you know the more hardcore research work I mean certainly in my field you know you can participate you can get yourself involved in curatorial projects uh, you can become an RA research assistant put your hand up you know get get to know people um, and really develop your network build your network and expand your network and that means going out to meet people 
tour, go to exhibitions, set up your website, put up your, you know, write reviews of exhibitions. In the beginning, it could be pro bono, but then later on, when, you know, you develop a research portfolio or writing portfolio, people will get to know you, they'll contact you. And that's how you can build your, um, your you know, your research portfolio as well as a teaching portfolio. So you have to, again, decide, you know, there's basically a lot you can do and not just apply, apply, apply. Um, prior to applying, you can start um, honing those skills and making you the best person so they can't reject you when you do apply um, and, and channel that energy to building those skills, building that research portfolio, building that teaching portfolio. I've mentioned casual work, I think, is a great place to begin only because the not that the bar is super low, but it's just less stringent, you know, is, and, and, and the, there are probably more casual work available. And if you do it really well, they'll keep hiring you. I'm not saying that that should be the track, that should be the direction that you should hit and be casual forever, but just saying that that is a, one way in which you can also, you know, have a taste of maybe this is not what you like. And and if this is not what you like, then maybe you should switch career. Um, but if you love it, then it will it will help to sharpen that resolve and make you really pursue it. And and while developing your um, teaching skills, which is something that you don't learn overnight, it takes time. This is an excellent point about getting a feel for what it's actually like, because I had no idea when I was doing my PhD what academia was like. Michelle, did you want to jump in and then I'll go to Aaron? Yeah, I did want to jump in. I think it's also good to have a plan ABC, right? And the plan C is just as good as the plan A. The plan that's good is the plan that works for you. So, you know, people who think, oh, I'm excellent, I'm going to get my decorate, right? everything's going to be fine, I think that's a fool's game, right? Because even if you are excellent, you may not get those grants. And the other thing is people who have never done teaching do not get permanent positions or seldom get permanent positions. So I have been in situations where I've seen people who have had decorators, other postdocs, but because they've never taught they actually don't get hired for the 40-40-20 position, which a lot of us is the ultimate aim, right, the ongoing 40-40-20 position. So there's a lot to be said too, as Yvonne says, for not only just understanding the work and you have to be able to do all aspects of this job um, unless you're in a very rarefied position as a research-only staff member, but also being good at it and being able to demonstrate that you are good at it. Yeah, thank you. Um, Aaron, um, I, I don't know if you had something to add to that. Um, if you if you do, feel free to go ahead. But I'd also like to ask you, um, having been in the position of reviewing postdoc um, applications, um, what immediately goes on the no pile? Yeah, so I guess I'll just kind of wrap up that last part of the conversation. So I was actually one of those where I was in that position trying to apply for a lot of jobs. And, you know, the timelines didn't work out, but I had that plan C. Um, so I actually worked in professional practice for about nine months after my, my finishing my PhD. And I think that was a great opportunity. Um, so I still had a vision of where I wanted to get after that. Um, so I sort of had that understanding, but sometimes, sometimes the timelines for academic hiring, it just doesn't work out. Um, so I think it's being flexible with that when you finish um, to ensure that you do land in the right position. And so I think to your second point, and I guess the, the comment or the question sort of directed on postdocs, it's ensuring that your application really is aligned with what um, the position actually is. I think the first thing that gets cut when having set on academic um, and also postdoc um, reviews is it's just not a fit. Um, so I think it's don't try to force yourself into a position um, just because you want to land that job. Ensure that your skills and your interests actually align with what that position is. Thank you. Um, okay, now we've got a question about um, it's a good question from Anand. And actually, I wanted to turn to developing a grant track record. So let's go to Anand's question. Could the panel comment on whether you need to be successful in shoring up some small grant funding before you can apply for major grant schemes? It's a good question. Sabine, would you like to address this? Yeah, look, I would say that you, you should really try try to do that. And it can be very hard um, right out of the PhD or even during the PhD. But, you know, um, try to work with people during your PhD where you might be, uh, you know, listed as a co-investigator uh, um, and, and you can you can justify that in the DECRA proposal. I was um, lucky enough, I had about $300,000 as a chief investigator on, on some international funding. Uh, and I think that that helps, right? So I, I would say aim for, at, you know, some of the internal grants at the University of Sydney, there are some strategic Grant smaller pots of money, perhaps, but um, certainly give it a go. And and uh, SIAC uh, offers a, a, a lot of wonderful support for 
um, PhD students and early career folks as well. So look out for those opportunities. Yeah, there's also initiatives through the Department of Foreign Affairs, um, grant schemes like the Australia Indonesia Institute, the Australia ASEAN Institute. Um, yeah, so the question I had prepared for this session, this um, section was how can I go about developing a grant winning track record before the high stakes DEFRA process? Um, Yvonne, yes. Yeah, so um, likewise, I agree with Sabine. I think it's, and in yourself as well, I think it's important to start small. And by small, I mean really small, like PRSS is as small as you can get, or you get $2,000 or less to travel uh, to give a paper. And that's a great place to start because it is already, you know, you're demonstrating a track record. You have to justify why they should fund you and not someone else. It is competitive. It is internal. And very likely, if you put together a solid proposal, you are going to get it. And that's a huge win. Put it down. And then the other thing that I'm going to also add, the two more things that I want to um, share with everyone is to work with um, academics. So work with experienced academics because they are eligible to apply for grants and you are not, uh, but they could definitely include you as um, as a collaborator, as a not just they are the CI, but you would be one of the other um, organizers, or or you'll be on 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 the grant as a recipient of that of that award. And to the point of pitching to them your idea and don't be afraid to do so. Um, I know a lot of us are very shy, but I think you have to put that aside and be super thick skin and say, I have this great idea for a conference. Um, but then, you know, I kind of need your help because I'm not eligible for it. And there'll be lots of academics who are more than happy to help you. And I have been, you know, obviously the recipient of these really generous um, mentors um, before me. And I've gotten $20,000 in 2017 and subsequently in 2019, I've gotten another 30000 from different pots. So never laugh at the amount and say, oh, you know, that's just $2,000. What are we going to do with that? That $2,000 can fund a guest speaker. And then, and, and then together, you know, they will add up to a huge, a, a, a bigger lot of money that can make that symposium happen. And then, of course, the other thing, and one last thing, and I'll shut up, um, is to see your peers as collaborators and not as competitors. I know it's really hard because, every, like I said, it's a competitive field. But I think for me, I've learned I, I, I've not just learned, but I have one of the best things about what I do is that my peers are my collaborators and we have developed so many projects together um, and it's been fun and and I don't know, it's just really gratifying. I, I just thought I would share this with you. It's it's so um, nice to see enthusiasm and positive messaging coming through because I think there's a dangerous session like this could be quite um, negative. Um, so I'm really happy to see your excitement talking about your your peers as collaborators of one. Um, Michelle, yes. Yeah, just um, when I was just finishing, well, in partway through my PhD, which I started in 98, I met, in that first year, I met two people who I have been not just good academic collaborators, but really close friends who, and we've come through our careers together. And I can't emphasise how much that was. And one of those conferences, it was the ASAA, and I'd been, I'd I started my PhD in July and it was in October. I knew nothing. I knew no one. It was terrifying, but I met two people there who to this day I, I count as close friends. So it's it's both about, you know, the cohort effect and, and a, a tide lifts all boats, right? So, you know, if you go in with a, 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 a scarcity mindset, um, that for me is a real problem because um, those of you who have heard me speak before will know that I think that academic generosity is actually – the best, the most important thing in your arsenal um, as a potential academic. Here, here. Um, now, we're running out of time. We only have 15 minutes. I don't know where that whole 45 minutes got, went. Um, I want to wrap up and hand over to the audience to ask any last questions, but there's just a couple of final questions I want to ask the panel before we do that. Um, why are prizes important? What sort of prizes and, and why? Um, Aaron, if you put your hand up for any prizes. I have. So I think it, I think they're important because it credentials you. Um, so it shows that you stand out from your peers. Um, and I think the thing that I really struggled and I, I haven't really understood, I think until recently is a lot of cases that they are self-nominated. Um, so I think it's important to put yourself out there. Um, and a lot of cases, the applicant pool sometimes aren't that large, even for prestigious prizes. Um, so I think sometimes you can surprise yourself. So I, I guess just Surprise. throw your name in the hat and you never know what can happen. <laughs> 
Excellent. Um, I've got to ask Sabine this question because what was the amazing prize you won, Sabine? I should know this. <laughs> well, um, I I was lucky to get the New South Wales Tall Poppy Award, um, and yeah. a few other a few other things, right? But as Aaron said, it's the recognition from your community that you are an emerging leader. So the Deep Carbon Observatory had an emerging um, leader award, and you know those sorts of things again, yeah, help with a track record demonstrating that. Um, and Yvonne has talked a lot about writing things down. She mentioned, you know, if you get internal funding for $2,000, write it down. Um, we will be holding a workshop a seminar later in the year on academic CVs. Make sure you put everything on your CV, including your internal funding. Yes, your research conference funding. Somebody just asked a question about that. Hassan um, just asked a question about that. Yes, that counts, whether it's internal or external. Um, and put your prizes down. Even if you're only nominated, you're still a nominee. So um, put all of this credentialing data, collect it all um, for your CV. Yvonne, did you have something to add before I ask this final question? Uh, no, it's something I haven't actually put my hand up for you know I haven't I haven't actually nominated myself for any of the prizes okay. I'm beginning to but that said I've gotten a lot <laughs> of scholarships in the past and I think that's also really important to include in your CV obviously um to dem you. You know, just demonstrate that you have the you know the caliber the academic caliber and the tenacity uh to get to absolutely where and actually, the process of writing a self-nomination for a prize is a very um, humbling and uh, one, and it really forces you to focus on what you actually have achieved. Um, so even the process of putting together a nomination is a good one. And Yvonne, the Vice Chancellor's Awards are open at the moment, so maybe you could rustle up some support for a nomination for one of those. We'll pursue that separately. Um, now, one last question before we hand over to the audience. Um, is it all bad news for people wanting academic jobs or is there hope? for us. So I'm going to ask Aaron, Yvonne, Sabine, and then Michelle. Yeah. I think that there is a lot of hope. I think that there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I think it's about being strategic about where you focus your efforts is kind of the piece of advice that I would offer. I think the just the freedom that comes with it and the ability to pursue your interests, um, if it's something that you're passionate about, I think that, um, you know, it's an, um, really an unparalleled opportunity. So... Thank you. And it's good to know that you haven't followed, you know, a, a straightforward path and that you did have that plan A, plan B, nine months in professional practice, and you have still managed to end up where you wanted to. Um, uh, Avon, next. Oh, um, <laughs> I think my case just represents the hope for everyone. Um, <laughs> I, so if I can do it, everyone can do it. Um, so it's unexpected, unimaginable. It's a lot of hard work. Um, but it's definitely worth it because it is my dream job. It may not be everybody's dream job, but it is my dream job. And I, um, and, and, and I'm just extremely, you know, I just want to add one little, you know, key takeaway for this is that there's no crumb too small and you just <laughs> never know. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I love it. I love it. I've won. I love your honesty. Thank you. Um, okay, who's going to ask next? Sabine, um, is there hope? Is it all bad news? Yeah, look, look. I mean, I, I think there's hope. Uh, for example, the new union at Sydney Uni has, uh, a, a, you know, pressed the university to hire more people, more academics, more teaching focused positions. That's uh, something that's coming online, you know. Um, but also the government is also... Uh, introducing new schemes as well so you have to you have to start thinking maybe perhaps being a little bit more flexible so for example the decra is often very much basic science research right but the industry fellowships are a bit more applied right so it, it, it's i think it's worth becoming a little bit more flexible and following the opportunities aligning yourself with big societal needs and challenges if you can you know uh, slot your research alongside that and I mean, you know, we we've started even SIAC talking about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but they're you know a really good good guide. And of course, there's the state and federal governments as well that have their priorities, right? Even in the DEC application itself, you have to actually align yourself with the national priorities. So try to get acquainted with those uh, and and other opportunities. Sure. Oh, thank you, Spin. Great. And uh, lucky last, Michelle, is it all bad news for people wanting academic jobs <laughs> or is there hope? 
Uh, not at all. Um, when I was finishing my PhD, academia was going through a crunch and I never actually felt brave enough to say to people I wanted to be an academic. Um, and I got a job. Other people around me, a number of people got jobs when we didn't think there were any. And 10 years later, I was a full professor. So I think that, of course, not everyone who wants a job is going to get a job. Um, not everyone's going to, um, it's a bit of a lottery, but it's also, as we've said, a lot about planning and strategy. And even for like my former students and other people in my sort of um, circles, I feel like a lot of, most people who really want an academic job and who have the chops for it, end up getting it, whether it be through plan A, B, C or X. Um, and the other thing I would want to say is about the teaching focus positions. Um, if you've got a teaching focus position at an institution like Sydney, that is a huge privilege because actually, even though you're doing a lot more teaching than your, your 40, 40, 20 peers, you're still actually probably doing less teaching than if you're at a tier two or tier three university. I worked at Flinders before I came here. And when I was finishing my PhD, I was working at USQ. So I have tried all levels of the system and my load at Flinders was so much higher than even a teaching focus position at Sydney. So the point is that you might not have as much privilege as the person in the office next to you, but but do, do recognise the opportunities you do have and don't, don't make the obstacles bigger than they really are because they're, they're big enough already and you don't need to make them bigger in your mind than they are. So look for the opportunities rather than focusing on the obstacles. Create peer groups, communities of practice, citation circles, all those things that help you um, in your academic career. And, you know, I think there's a lot of hope. Love it. Thank you. Um, now, I said I wanted to finish five minutes early, which gives us four minutes. We have had a lot of questions coming through the chat, um, but if anyone would like to ask a question in the group, if you're brave enough, um, I can't actually see everyone because we have so many participants, but um, feel free to put your hand up and or pop something in the chat. Um, I, I'll take if that's okay. Sorry. Uh, let yes. Me just run. Uh, oh, hi, Laura. Hi. Yeah, I have a question about um, working remotely. So I know it was mentioned before about living away from Australia, but say even if you're in Australia and you are living in a different city or that sort of thing, I mean, post-pandemic, what do you reckon about um, the influence of that on academic careers? Is it better to stick to institutions close by or is it still possible to apply for work remotely, basically? Uh, yeah, that's a good point about the pandemic and one we didn't mention in our first discussion about the DECRA clock. I think you can, if you've been um, affected by the pandemic, you can um, add some time onto your DECRA clock. Please check that. That information might be out of date, but it is just worth mentioning. Um, I, I don't really know the answer to that. Maybe um, one of our panellists would like to jump in there about working remotely and focusing on universities close to you versus... If we're talking about the DECRA scheme or any of the ARC schemes, you can um, approach universities to host you anywhere in Australia, right? Um, but you then have to work through them, right? The University of Sydney requires that you work at least somewhere in New South Wales because of the payroll tax and insurance regulations, right? And then, but of course, um, it all is also governed by your local school and their expectations, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, how many times you come into the office so there's still a gray area about about that but um yeah hopefully that yeah clarifies some of it um the other thing i probably wanted i don't think i'm actually answering this question because sometimes we don't really have a choice but one of the things that i did realize and i wish somebody had you know shared this with me when i was first embarking on this you know trajectory was that um you you might be expected if you if you if you're passionate about an academic you know, in, in, in a career in academia, you might have to be prepared to relocate. You might have to be prepared to leave your home town or home country and friends and family and be prepared to relocate to another institution that's hiring. Um, it could be temporary. I mean, it's just really just to build that mouse, you know, build your portfolio, like I said, you know, prove yourself and all of that. And then once you've got, uh, you know, sufficient um, teaching experience and whatnot, so you can look out for jobs that's closer to home. But this is something that I haven't realised until I was in it. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that's really true, Avon. Maybe Michelle. I would add there, I mean, it's great that people can work from distance, but it's not the same. 
And, you know, if you haven't read it and you're interested in Southeast Asia, I recommend reading um, Robert Cribb's um, essay, The Circles of Esteem. And one of his points is, you know, of course it's about your academic work, but it's also about your networks and who you know. And if you're the remote person who no one knows the face, no one engages, it's A, hard for you to stay motivated, but it also means that people don't get to know you as a person. And, I mean, if you're a horrible person, that could be excellent, but assuming most of us aren't, then that can be a real disadvantage because you don't start to build, people don't invest in you in the same way. And I don't think you should underestimate um, but again, Natalie, Natalie has benefited from my personal investment. She impressed me. And so I invested in her as a number of other people on this call at the moment. So don't underestimate that because that's hard by distance. Yeah, yeah that, collegi so, that collegiality yeah. aspect is really important. And this also applies to PhD students per a conversation we were having earlier this week about if you go off track, it's very hard to get back on if you're working remotely. Um, and just on that point that Michelle mentioned in terms of investing in me um, and mentoring me and some of the other, you know, panellists and also participants in this workshop, um, what I've noticed is that I feel like I have developed a sort of momentum. So having, you know, sought out this, these um, strategic public publishing opportunities and teaching opportunities or prizes and awards, you do start to develop um, a momentum. And once you've established that and the first five years are critical, um, you know, I think that's incredibly powerful and uh, there's only a limited amount of time post-PhD to capitalise on that. Um, and I'm I'm actually starting to notice the effects of that now in, in a very good way. Um Okay, so uh, I think we're going to wrap up there. Like I said, we do have um, a couple of other SEAC skills workshops coming up later in the year. One of them is public speaking, um, and that is only for students and academics from University of Sydney and Western Sydney University. And it's tied into the Indonesia Council Open Conference that we're running in September. Um, and then we also have another skills workshop on um, building a good CV, I think. Um, so if uh, you want to be um, notified of those opportunities, please make sure you've signed up for our, our newsletter and our SEAC uh, newsletter and you'll receive notification about those workshops. Um, so it was Great to have this discussion. I would really like to thank our panellists, Aaron, Yvonne, Sabine and Michelle, um, and wish you all the best uh, for your future academic pathways. Thank you.